I'd like to give a warm welcome to all of our law students and school administrators from across the country uh, that have made time in their busy schedules to join us today. Oh, am I skipping? Okay, sorry. My name is Kevin Harmon uh, and I'll be your moderator. Uh, I am a senior talent acquisition specialist in our HR placement division and I help coordinate our law clerk program for the New Jersey Judiciary Courts. Uh, before I kick things off uh, with an overview of New Jersey courts and our one-of-a-kind law clerkship program, then let's go over some housekeeping items. Uh, the webinar will be approximately one to one and a half hours long. Uh, we will have some opportunities throughout the webinar for questions uh, through our Zoom Q&A feature. Uh, please try not to use the chat feature. Um, we're more accustomed to the Q&A, um, but we'll, have, uh, we'll also have an opportunity for uh, a longer a Q&A session uh, towards the end of the webinar. Um, if we do not have the opportunity to answer all of your questions during the webinar, uh, we will follow up uh, after the event. Uh, a little bit about you know, New Jersey courts and our judicial clerk, uh, clerkship program. New Jersey court system is recognized as, as uh, recognized and respected nationally for our progressive uh, and innovative work. Uh, additionally, we have an advanced information technology infrastructure that has enabled the critical work of the courts to continue during the COVID-19 pandemic. I can't speak highly enough of our information technology department uh, during this time. They really did transition us from, you know, never really working from home or working remotely ever uh, to within three days uh, being up and running to, to continue the work of the courts. Um, now, also, did you know that, you know, in New Jersey, we have the largest state law clerkship program uh, in the nation. Um, each year, our judges hire approximately 480 clerks statewide. Our, our panelists are here today to describe the critical work of our judicial law clerks and to provide you information on the application process. Uh, and I'm honored uh, to introduce our panel. Uh, they're each going to take a few minutes to let you know a little bit about themselves. Uh, but first off, uh, we have the Honorable Judge uh, Badoti Byrne. Uh, who is a presiding judge of the General Equity Division uh, representing Morris Sussex County Visnage. Um, judge, tell us a little about yourself. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here with you all. Um, I am Maritza berdoti Byrne. I'm the presiding judge of the um, Chancery Division. That means I am responsible for the general equity docket, the probate docket, and the foreclosure docket in both uh, Sussex and Morris County. Prior to that, I served as a presiding judge in the family division for six years. I was born in Cuba. I grew up in Hudson County, New Jersey. I am a double knight. That means I went to, to undergraduate school at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, and I went to law school at Rutgers in Newark. Um, I did not clerk, which is probably my greatest professional regret. I did not clerk mostly out of a lack of understanding as to how important a clerkship would be to my continued development as an attorney um, and the exposure and opportunities it would afford me. I made a strictly economic decision at the time and went directly to Pitney, Harmon, Kip and Such, which is now Day Pitney. Um, later, I became a partner at McCusker and Selmy, Rosen and Carvelli. And later on, I was um, in-house at UBS prior to coming on the bench. Um, I did not attend an infor informational seminar such as this when I was in law school, and I truly regret it. I am hoping that collectively this panel will be able to give you enough information to make an informed decision um, as to what clerkship you would like to participate in. And I hope that we will convince you that a clerkship is in your best interest. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Bernardi Byrne, appreciate it. Uh, next, we have the Honorable Judge Mark Tarantino representing our, our Burlington County Visnage uh, Criminal Division. Uh, Judge Tarantino. Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Tarantino. I'm here in Burlington County. I'm one of five judges in the criminal division. I'm now the drug court judge. Um, I did also go to Rutgers uh, College in New Brunswick, although decades before Judge Berdotti Byrne. Um, 
because I'm way, way older than she is. And um, uh, I also went to Rutgers Law School, in, but in Camden, uh, class of 81, Rutgers Camden Law School. So that was 50, no, 40 years ago. And um, I remember being in law school and I, I knew other students were applying for clerkships. And I said, what is that? And they really couldn't explain it too well. And I thought, eh, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not something I'm interested in. But I didn't have a choice because I was a, a scholar, ROTC scholarship student. So actually, I was obligated to serve four years active duty in the Army, which was, which was fine. So I spent four years at Fort Dix. Then I spent another 24 years part time as a JAG officer. So I'm uh, in the National Guard. So I'm retired from the uh, from the military in that sense. But after I got out of the Army, I started my own office in Mount Holly. And I did that for 29 years. And so I was um, uh, it was just me and one secretary. And I did that for 29 years. I was happy to do that. But I got the opportunity to come up here to Burlington uh, County. uh, And that happened in 2014. Um, I have my seventh law clerk, Tara Carlin, who is, um, you may know if you are a student at Rutgers Camden, she graduated last uh, spring. Uh, She's my seventh law clerk, and I've already hired my eighth law clerk, um, and uh, she's ready to start in August. And I think that this is a wonderful opportunity to enhance your professional career, and we'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Judge Tarantino. Our, our last judicial panelist is the newest member of our New Jersey State Supreme Court, uh, the Honorable Justice Pierre Louis. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, yes, I am the newest member of the Supreme Court of New Jersey. I just joined the court last year when I was sworn in on September 1st. Um, I am also a double Rutgers graduate, double Scarlet Knight. I attended Rutgers New Brunswick undergrad and then Rutgers Camden um, uh, Law School. So um, I'm very excited that Rutgers is back in the NCAA tournament for the first time in 30 years. I just had to put that in there. (laughs) Um, I am originally from Brooklyn but moved to Irvington, New Jersey when I was eight years old. And um, I actually started my career here at the Supreme Court of New Jersey because I was a law clerk to Justice John Wallace Jr. Um, When I was in law school, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do after I graduated and I didn't know any lawyers. I wasn't familiar with the legal profession, so I certainly didn't know what a clerkship was, but um, at the time, the career services department at Rutgers and Camden, and they probably still do this now, they spent a lot of time putting on panel discussions like this um, uh, so that the students could hear from judges and law clerks so we can have an idea of what clerkship experience is like. So after attending many of those, I decided, well, I should probably do this because they're taking, they're spending a lot of time and energy to um, convince us that it's the right way to go. So I'm really happy that I did. And I'm, I'm happy that you all are here today um, getting this information Um, After my clerkship uh, for the Supreme Court, I I went to Montgomery McCracken Walker and Rhodes um, in Cherry Hill, and I worked there as an associate in the litigation department and the white collar crime practice group. Um, I then joined the U.S. Attorney's Office in Newark as an assistant U.S. Attorney. Um, Shortly thereafter, I moved to the Trenton office and then the Camden office, and I was um, eventually appointed um, as the attorney in charge of both of those offices. Um, After nine years at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I returned to Montgomery McCracken as a partner in the White Collar and Government Investigations Practice Group, and I remained there until I was appointed to the court last year. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Justice Pierre-Louis. Appreciate it. And for the rest of the law schools out there, it was not planned that we had all Rutgers representatives uh, today. So we'll try to differentiate it up uh, in our future. <laughs> we wanted to um, plug that Rutgers is going to do phenomenal in the tournament. That's what. <laughs> okay, very good. All right. We are also joined today by one of our, our current law clerks, uh, Jeling Chen uh, from Yesheva University, uh, Cardozo uh, School of Law. Uh, Jelaine works at our administrative office of the courts, our central office, where I'm yeah, at this morning. Uh, with uh, she, he works for presiding judge Mala Sundar of the of the tax division. Um, Mr. Chen, tell us a little about yourself. Um, hi, uh, everyone. My name is Jelaine. Uh, I'm the law clerk for Judge Sundar, uh, which is a tax court um, where we deal with local property tax and state tax cases. Um, I graduated from Cardozo. 
uh, around May last year, and I've been clerking for the tax court since uh, September. Um, I've been working 100% remotely since the beginning of my clerkship. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I hope all of the law students here would apply. Um, feel free to ask me any questions. All right, all right. Thank you, Jialing. Uh, now, one note, uh, Judge Sundar, um, she'll, be, she'll be one of our panelists on our March 31st webinar. Uh, but thank you, uh, Jaling and, and judges and Justice Pierre Louis, uh, for those introductions. Now let's let's jump right into it um, with a question for for Judge Berdati Byrne. Um, you know, from your perspective, what is it like to work as a judicial clerk in the New Jersey courts? All right. Well, good afternoon. I'm so pleased again to be with you all. I just want to take a moment for to thank the students for taking the time out to participate and to learn about clerkships. It's important to take your career into your own hands and make um, qualified decisions as to how to proceed. So I'm glad that you're with us today. I wanna to take a moment um, when I agreed to participate on this panel, I did not know who my co-panelists would be. I'm so happy to be presenting with my friend, my colleague, Judge Tarantino. He and I do a lot of uh, teaching to, at judicial college, at new judges training, and at law clerk orientation. So we're sort of like on the road together. We're Abbott and Costello, although I think I just dated us. I don't think the law clerks know who Abbott and Costello are. Um, so it's, it's great to be with you. And I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge our newest Supreme Court Justice, Justice Pierre-Louis. Um, I look forward to working with you on this and many other issues important to the judiciary. I can tell you that all of my colleagues are extremely impressed with your accomplishments and we're very excited that you've ascended to the Supreme Court. Um, Attorney Chen, I do not know you, but I look forward to having you appear before me or work on these projects together. Now, I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about what's expected of a law clerk. As a judge's law clerk, you are the gatekeeper to the judge. You are the gatekeeper to chambers. You are the face of chambers. You are the voice of chambers. You are the li liaison between the judge and the community. As all of you know, judges are not allowed to have ex parte communications with attorneys or self-represented litigants. Every communication that a judge has with parties should be on the bench or should be recorded. So the way that we communicate, particularly on procedural matters, um, is through the law clerk. And that gives you uh, great exposure to attorneys and to the public at large during your clerkship. Uh, primary duties are going to vary by division. What a family law clerk does is very different from a um, criminal law clerk, uh, law, uh, law clerk, and I can't speak to the appellate division and I can't speak to the Supreme Court, uh, but certainly in any division, you will be doing a lot of writing. Writing is a critical component um, of a law clerk's duty, um, and um, as a result, your writing will improve vastly. It doesn't matter where you start, in your writing uh, with a judge, but it will improve. You will see good writing, you will see not so good writing, um, and you will see excellent writing. And as a result of that, you will learn how to control your active voice, your passive voice, and the voice that the court writes in, which is a completely neutral um, voice uh, devoid of any uh, personal opinions or adjectives, just the law and just the facts. So that is one of the advantages, I believe, of being a clerk. Um, your writing will, will vastly improve. Um, as a law clerk, you will interface, as I said, with the public. You will regularly speak to attorneys. Uh, you will re regularly interact with self-represented litigants and you will be responsible for establishing deadlines with them and deadlines with the court. Again, depending on the division, you will mediate cases. All of our law clerks are offered um, are, and required to take a multi-day mediation program and are required to mediate 
uh, certain cases uh, between self-represented litigants. I think one of the things that the New Jersey ju judiciary does really well, both for law clerks and for judges, is offer all of this training. All of the training is free and the mediation program is free training that you take with you after you leave your clerkship um, and is it, very valuable. Personally, and I know every judge is a little different, but personally, I give my law clerks great autonomy. I treat them as the attorneys that they are. Um, they have graduated from law school. They've taken the bar by the time they come uh, to work in chambers. And soon after, they usually pass the bar and are sworn in. So I, gave, I give them discretion to grant adjournments within certain parameters. I give them discretion to schedule my calendar. They have a great deal of discretion as to when the work gets performed as long as it's performed within the rules of court. I meet with law clerks regularly, but I expect them to work independently and learn to make decisions. I like to ask them to tell me how they would rule after hearing an oral argument or after reading a motion before I tell them what I think, because I think that that creates um, better analytical skills. I wanna hear what they heard. Sometimes they surprise me. Sometimes they point something out that I haven't really focused on. Um, so it's a, it's a synergistic uh, relationship. I explained to my law clerks that my deadlines are their deadlines. Uh, and personal time management is a large part of the, their responsibility and the job. Uh, when they go to work for a law firm or in the public sector, no one's going to be sending them reminders. No one's going to be asking them, where's this draft? Where's that draft? So I try to bridge that uh, year between law school, uh, which is very structured and very regimented, and the actual practice of law after a clerkship, uh, which is uh, where you are responsible for your own work product all of the time. I could go on and on and on about the benefits of clerkship, including interfacing with the public and exposure and experience, but I recognize that I'm the first speaker. So I'm going to stop there and uh, let some of my colleagues speak. All right, well, thank you, Judge Bertani Byrne, um, for that perspective. Uh, and so, you know, some of us on here do know who Abbott and Costello are. Um, <laughs> all right, now, Jailing, um, tell us a little bit about, you know, about your, your work as a judicial uh, law clerk uh, within the New Jersey court system. Sure. Um, basically, I'm involved with everything that the judges do. Um, I work very closely with her, help her make decisions for the case that includes reading the brief, the facts, sharing the cases, drafting, review, and editing opinions, and, and also help with the correspondence with the court, uh, scheduling issue procedural questions the attorneys have. Um, I take conference call each week uh, with attorneys about the status of the case. So ask them questions about you know how the discovery is going, whether there will be a settlement. Um, I'm also responsible for uh, the motion calendar, which is basically keeping track of when motion is due. This is called return date. And on a return date, um, if the motion is unopposed, you draft an order um, disposing the motion. And if it is opposed, then you schedule or arguments, pair the case, read the briefs, and draft opinion to decide the motions. Um, um, so yeah, so I mean, every day is different, but. Uh, I, I think it's a very interesting job, so gotcha. I absolutely love Good, good. Uh, Judge Tarantino, um, you know, I, you've been here since last year, so you've gotten a chance to see how we made that transition, you know, once COVID-19 hit. Um, you know, what type of changes have you seen, I guess, within your, your law clerks that they've had to deal with, uh, you know, during, during this pandemic? Well, it's certainly a challenge to uh, have to deal with um, remote proceedings. It kind of uh, defeats some of the goals that I set for my law clerks because it's better to have the law clerk. And, uh, you know, we're on the same chambers. I have a secretary of a law clerk and my office, three offices in the same grouping here. And um, <clears throat> it, it was much better when everybody was here every day because um, any little thing I could uh, mention to my uh, law clerk. So it's it's much more difficult. The um, uh, I try to stay in constant contact. We have at least one 
uh, conference call uh, every day. Um, and my secretary is also involved as well, so we can work as a team. Um, you know, when, when I start, I told every law clerk when we start the year, I said, I have three goals, uh, three goals in mind. One, of course, we have the work. We're going to do the work. Second, I want to mentor you and advance you professionally. And third, I want to help you get a job. And so far, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, 100% successful, and every law clerk who's left has had a job. Um, so um, in my chambers, you know, law clerks manage cases, they uh, review submissions, there's writing uh, that happens. And um, we have uh, post-conviction relief memos, which are uh, cases where someone wants another look at their conviction and those require an opinion. So we write legal opinions and law clerk gets us uh, started. Um, but um, uh, it, it is a challenge when we're remote, hopefully, We'll get uh, back to uh, in-person proceedings. I do. I, we are allowed in my county to uh, have the law clerk come in uh, occasionally, as, as well as the secretary. So uh, every week or two, um, I will have Tara come in, and uh, uh, those are always very productive days because we get so much more done uh, with in-person um, contact. Gotcha, gotcha. Good, good. Uh, Justice Pierre Louis, uh, how have you, uh, I guess, been utilizing your law clerks uh, during your first year here? Um, so, so my clerks have been wonderful. Um, you know, I started in September, so we were already fully, um, in, um, you know, several months into the pandemic. Um, initially I, I, I have three law clerks. So in chambers, it's myself, my secretary and three, the three law clerks. Um, certainly it would be great if we would all, we're all here together at the same time. Um, initially I started out with having at least one clerk here, um, per day and then the other to working remotely. And then in the fall, when the, 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 the numbers were rising during the second surge, we just decided to have the clerks work remotely, but hoping that that'll change in the coming months. Um, uh, you know, the, the work that they do has, has remained the same. Um, you know, clerking at the Supreme Court um, uh, involves a lot of researching and writing with regard to the cases that come before the court. Um, the clerks spend a lot of time working on petitions for certification. Uh, that's the vehicle parties must, must use um, to ask the Supreme Court to hear their case. The court does not hear um, every case. We only grant cert on a small percentage of cases, but the law clerks play a huge role in that process. And even working remotely, since all the documents and all the filings are accessible electronically, they're able to get all of those files um, because they're the ones that review the filings, the records, and they draft memorandums recommending to the court whether we should grant or deny certification for any particular case. Um, the clerks also play a big role in uh, preparing the justices for the matters that are going to be heard uh, before the court and uh, going to be argued. So throughout the year, the clerks draft bench memoranda on those cases. And the bench memos are uh, really the one comprehensive document um, that tells you pretty much everything you need to know about the case, everything in the record, all the applicable case law, all the facts, and their recommendation on how they think the court should rule. So, um, you know, in, in everything that they do, there's a lot of analysis that, that goes into it. And, you know, as was mentioned before, before they speak to me or know what I think they're putting, you know, um, their analysis and their recommendation as to what they believe the court should do on pretty much on all the cases that come before the court. So, um, you know, there, and there are other um, uh, uh, matters and memos that the clerks handle, but those are the big two. Um, so they get a chance to, to take a really deep, big, deep dive into the areas of law that their bench memos cover and their sort of petitions. Um, but working remotely, I think has been, um, you know, you know, sometimes challenging, but, you know, we've been doing it since the beginning. So it's been working well. We have standing teams meetings. So we're seeing each other and talking to each other very often, um, whether that's all as a group or individually uh, with the clerks, uh, we make sure we, we do that very often. So I think it's been working well. And um, one of the benefits of having multiple clerks is that they form a bond and they get to work really well together. And I know that they're often on teams meetings together and, you know, they're working really well and helping each other out. So it's been good. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judge uh, Berdotti, um, what, what kind of cases um, are seen in a, in a chancery court? 
<laughs> so in the general equity division, almost all cases come in by a verified complaint in order to show cause, which means those are the cases where civil cases where the litigants are not suing each other for money damages, but they're seeking to have the court require something to be done or keep a party from doing something. So um, restrictive covenant cases, property cases, um, you name it, <laughs> and it comes to chancery. Um, and that requires um, a very quick turnaround. Generally, uh, an order to show cause should be heard within 72 hours, according to the court rules, depending on the type of case. Sometimes we give the, uh, the uh, defendant a little bit of time to be able to answer. Otherwise, we have a hearing within 72 hours on temporary restraints. Um, and for that reason, primarily, I do have two law clerks. And I agree with Justice Pierre-Louis that there is an advantage in that they work together um, and uh, try to figure things out before, sometimes before they come to me, although that's not necessary. Um, the foreclosure case docket uh, is all about um, residential or commercial foreclosures, evictions, those sorts of cases come before me. Again, um, an order to show cause to stop a sheriff's sale or stop an eviction is a hearing, it's an emergent hearing. In probate, we handle all the wills uh, cases, but we also handle special medical guardianships and guardianships for adults. Those are emergent matters. So it's a very fast paced environment. Um, things are heard very quickly and we have to uh, mobilize very quickly. I will also say that because it's so specialized, a lot of attorneys don't know how to file papers correctly either for an order to show cause, a special medical guardianship, a stay. Uh, and a large part of what my law clerks do uh, is not give legal advice, but kind of navigate the procedure and let them know what they need to do in order to get their case heard more quickly, what the rules require, what papers are required. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good. Good. Now, so this is a question for, for all panelists. Jump in if you can. Um, but what are what are uh, some ideal traits um, you would look, uh, I guess, you would look for in each uh, uh, law clerk and and how may they uh, differ from traits that may be favorable for for law firms looking for attorneys? Well, I learned this from uh, Judge Ford, the assignment judge in Ocean County. She says, I always look for customer service skills, someone who has had prior jobs in the service industry, such as uh, servers, uh, people who work in stores. And I always look for that. I think that that is a, 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 one of the most important things. Um, of course, the interview, you know, you have to have the right personality. Um, uh, you know, in, in the interview, somebody has to be professional. They have to be outgoing. They have to be genuine. Um, and I don't really concentrate so much on grades. They're not as important to me as other uh, other traits. Um, you know, like I don't, I'm not looking for a law review person. Um, I did have a law review editor come and interview with me, um, and she was a, a, a fantastic uh, young lawyer and uh, would was just not a good fit for what I do. She's probably better in the, the appellate division or in the Supreme Court. Uh, this is somebody that needs to write a lot. Is very was very smart. Not a good fit. Um, you know, look for experience, le any prior legal experience, any non-legal experience. Um, I, I have this pet peeve. I don't like it when people say you're right. I honed my skills. You know, I had this job and I honed my skills. So that's just that's just my my thing. Um, I also don't like I, I, what's a turnoff. Also, is if you list on your resume frivolous hobbies. You know, like I like to sh go shopping or I like you know fantasy or video games. You know, fine if you like to do those things, but don't put them on a on a resume. And I also look at, the, you know, I want the person to be themselves in the interview. I don't want them to be too nervous. Um, also, it's nice to have an idea of what the career path and goals would be. Um, you know, you can always change your mind later, but it'd be nice to know what, you know, what your general plan is at the, at the present time. You know, when we do these interviews, we're really interviewing each other. You're interviewing me. I'm interviewing you. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's something uh, that I look for. I also look for 
somebody who applies on time. We have a system in New Jersey where there's a portal. It's open usually like the fifth Monday or fourth Monday rather in June uh, or third Monday in June. That's when it's open. Uh, I look for people that do that because it shows that they actually want to be a law clerk and not uh, and that they're prompt and they're focused and they're not just looking for another job because you'll get people straggling in with their applications. I hire right off the bat. I mean, my current law clerk will look at all the applications on the first day or so of the portal. We'll eliminate everybody except for the top two or three. Uh, and then we'll schedule appointments as quickly as possible. The, you know, in my mind, it's like the it's like a sports draft, you know, like grab up the the, the, the best ones early before they go somewhere else. Um, and so, um, you know, I look for look for the promptness in somebody uh, applying. And actually, you know, when you come in for the interview, you're not just interviewing with me. We have a little system here where you interview. First, you sit down with my secretary. And then she'll sneak into my office and go, yeah, I like this person or, eh, you know, whatever. And then you'll sit down with you'll sit down with the law clerk and, and sort of chat because you're waiting for the judge. I'm ready. But they're and then they'll they'll tell me what they think. And then I'll see you. So you're interviewing with all three of us uh, when you when you come in. So that's that's what I look for. All right. Judge Tarantino, you're stealing my thunder a little bit. Uh, I was going to bring <laughs> bring up those interview questions towards the end of the webinar, but it's OK. We'll have things uh, working organically as we go along here. <laughs> Um, so general question again for the panelists, um, and I think Judge Tarantino touched on a little bit, but you know, with, with research and, and writing being vital skills, um, do you have any advice or suggestion as to how to continue to hone those skills uh, while working as a clerk? Well, um, as I mentioned, you know, at the Supreme Court or, you know, well, any clerkship, you're going to be doing a lot of writing, um, particularly in an appellate clerkship. Um, it, you really just it just is going to happen. <laughs> I mean, if you're spending an entire year um, doing nothing but researching and writing, um, it's going to be the case that your your skills are going to improve and your writing is going to be better. Um, you know, so so I don't think there's any there's much concern um, with regard to improving your writing skills and researching skills during your clerkship. That's something that will organically happen while you're while you're doing the work. Um, like I mentioned here at the court my clerks are being handed cases involving all types of issues one day it could be a product liability case another day it can be a case it might be a case involving workers compensation another day it could be a case involving um, a petition for post-conviction really uh, uh, you know for post-conviction relief um, and a variety of different criminal issues that come before the court so you know they're exposed to a wide variety of of um case types. And so they have to really um, uh, be able to research in a manner that um, allows them to get the answers and, and inform themselves in, in, a, in, in, a, in a quick um, manner and be able to draft up their memos, present them to the court in a way that is beneficial for us keeping to, to keep moving forward. So so I think, you know, during during the clerkship, that's just going to be some that's one of the benefits of a clerkship that your your skills in those areas are just going to improve. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good. Good. Um, so uh, for Jaling, um, you know, with your experience as a law clerk, um, tell us tell us why one should or why should a law clerk um, or a law student pursue a judicial clerkship? Um, I think you just learn a lot from the judges, from the staff, uh, from other law clerks, both um, substantively about the law and also about how to communicate with other people, um, how to communicate with attorneys and how to deal with difficult situations. Um, so during law school, you read a lot of cases. Through the clerkship, you really get to see how the cases were made or how the opinions were made. So you will learn how the judges um, select facts select facts, um, um, pick the law that they want to talk about, and then make the decision and draft the opinion. So I think it's a good opportunity to see um, the inside workings of an uh, opinion, I guess. Good, good. Thank you. Uh, Judge Ber Ber Berdody Byrne, um, how, how do you think or how, you know, with your, your current uh, past law clerks, how has a clerkship enhanced uh, a lawyer's professional career? Well, um, I've had 11 clerks in my eight years on the bench, and no two have been the same. You asked before about um, what I look for in a law clerk. I'm looking for someone who has insight, 
into what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. If someone comes into me and says, I'm a fabulous writer, but I really could work on mediation skills more, then I'll focus on that. If someone says, I really need more help on legal analysis, but I think I'm really good with people and I, I really think I can settle cases and, and I think I wanna do that. So it gives you an opportunity. I consider clerkship almost a finishing school. Law schools do not teach you how to be a lawyer, nor should they, I think. I think they should teach you to think analytically, but you've never seen a complaint before. You've never drafted a counterclaim. You don't know how to file an order to show cause. You don't know what a verified complaint is versus a complaint. You will get a year to see all of this. And as I said before, you'll see attorneys who do it well and attorneys who do it not so well. I like to think that I learn more from my mistakes than from my successes. As a clerk, you're going to learn from everyone's mistakes because the judge will point out to you, don't do that at oral argument. Concede that point. You didn't need to argue there. The judge was agreeing with you. All of those things you will learn. I think the other benefit of a clerkship is that you get to interview law firms. If you're interested in the private sector, it's different. I can't speak to criminal law in the public sector, but you get to interview them for a year. You get to see the paperwork, the submissions that they make. You get to see how their lawyers present arguments. And you might say, oh, I want to go work with this firm, or I really don't like the business model at this particular firm. So it's a, it's a year-long interview process of potential employers. Um, as Judge Tarantino mentioned, obviously we cannot guarantee a job for you. We don't pull strings to get you a job, but we sit you down in January. Where are you looking? What are you interested in? Where should you be looking? Let me look at your resume. Let me look at your cover letter. We do that, and we obviously take pride in ensuring that all of our law clerks are placed uh, at the end of their clerkship. Um, finally, there's a benefit in networking with other law clerks. These people, these other clerks will be your friends for life. They will be your colleagues. When you're looking to move from one law firm to another, you're going to contact them. I have a very close girlfriend from law school who married a clerk 30 years ago that she clerked with, and they're still happily married. So these people are going to be your first network of professional con colleagues and contacts, and they will be with you for the rest of your life. So one of the things that I ask my clerk to do is to regularly organize events with the other law clerks, social events, where they're going to lunch, they're playing softball, they almost won the, ch the league championship last year. Uh, maybe they're going out for a beer after work, but they are definitely socializing and forming those bonds as well. Gotcha. Good, good. Um, now, Judge Tarantino, what, what are some of the you know, types of jobs your, your past law clerks have been able to secure? Well, I was in family division doing children in court, which is abuse and neglect of children cases. And of when I did that, most of the law clerks, I'd say uh, three of them, maybe four of them, four of them got jobs as law guardians. And they were attractive to the law guardian's office in that they had experience and um, they were recruited by uh, the law guardians here and they had proved that they were all good law clerks. They're terrific. They proved themselves to be good at that type of uh, job. One law clerk always wanted to do um, wills and estates and estate planning. And so had nothing to do with the clerkship, but she learned how to be organized and how to manage cases and um, she got a good a job at a, at a good firm. Uh, and then my last uh, law clerk, now we're firmly in criminal division. She's an assistant prosecutor in Salem County. And uh, that's something she always uh, wanted to do. And um, she was hired uh, as, you know, she, again, attractive to the prosecutor's office who hired her because she was a, uh, a law clerk in, for a criminal division judge. So it definitely gives you a leg up. And, and that's why we've been so uh, successful. Gotcha. Good, good. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Jaling, uh, you know, work with Judge uh, Sundar. Um, what are some of the ways she's helped, uh, I guess, build up your skill set uh, to be a, to be uh, you know attractive to future employees, employers? Sorry. 
Well, um, I help her drafting opinion. I do research. Then she will comment on my drafting and she'll edit in my draft. So it's a fantastic way to learn writing. Um, and also we talk about stuff outside of work too. Um, um, sorry, I'm just getting nervous. <laughs> no worries, no worries. <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, that's about it, sorry. Okay, all right. Now, Justice Pierre-Louis, um, a question from the audience. Uh, what, what is the turnaround time for a, a bench memo at the Supreme Court level? So the bench memos, because they're pretty <laughs> pretty comprehensive memo, memoranda, the, the turnaround time is usually, I think, about six weeks. So the clerks have a, they have a significant amount of time to draft those memorandums, those memorandums, um, um, again, because they, uh, you know, are very comprehensive. And it's really the first thing that I reach for um, and most other justices reach for when preparing for a case for oral argument before we take a look at the transcripts and, um and you know anything else in the record and, and and the briefs, so they get about six weeks, I think. Um, the petitions for certification memos are a much shorter time frame. Um, we get a lot of those, so they have a much shorter time frame. But those those memorandums are not as um, extensive, not as long, um, depending on the case. But they're not; they're usually um, much shorter. But they have a, a much shorter amount of time to work on those. Gotcha. Okay, good, good. Um, let's see. Um, Justice uh, Berdati Byrne, what's, uh, I guess, what's been your overall mentoring relationship like uh, between, you know, your, your current law clerk, but also any previous uh, law clerks you've had? Well, again, it runs the gamut and it depends on personality. Um, I have had all sorts of law clerks. I've had um, some very quiet clerks who are very interested in um, writing. Uh, I've had more social clerks. Uh, it really depends on what they need. But what I try to do early on is, is establish what they want out of the clerkship relationship. Again, it's very important for me to have a law clerk who has insight into their strengths and their weaknesses because we all have them and they're all different. Uh, and say, these are my strengths and I wanna work on these and develop these, or these are my weaknesses, I wanna improve these. So that I know kind of the template and how I can help. Um, uh, it, it's a busy job. So sometimes um, you need to be proactive in getting the attention of the judge. Sometimes the judge is on the, on the uh, bench all day, um, but we are, always available to law clerks. I know now that we are uh, remote, I get a lot of texts at night and on the weekends and we, we kind of work more around the clock than we usually do when we're in chambers. But um, I, I, I try to be available to them, but I let them tell me what they need from me. Um, and I think at this stage in a young lawyer's career, they should be able to tell their judge this is what I need. This is where I can use help. Uh, will you look at this? I will say that I have uh, great relationships with my clerks um, from the past. I just, I receive calls all the time as they're changing firms or changing jobs, asking me to um, give references and, and let them know whether they would be a good fit for a future job. So that's a benefit, I think, too. Gotcha. Okay, good. Thank you. I actually have all my clerks meet my new clerk. I have a dinner at the beginning <laughs> of the cl new clerk's clerkship so that they can kind of talk to one another and talk about me, yeah. <laughs> and what I, my pet peeves and, and, uh, and things like that. And they, then they have a network of people that they can contact. Right. If they don't want to ask me in the first instance. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, good. Uh, so the next question I'm going to open up to all panels. Where I'm going to start off with uh, Justice Pierre Louis, but uh, Judge Tarantino touched on it before, and I know a lot of law clerks or law students uh, uh, joining us today uh, probably most interested in, in this line of questioning. But what do you look for in a potential law clerk? And do you have any tips for the application or, or overall interview process? 
Um, sure. So um, to piggyback off of some of what um, Judge Tarantino mentioned, you know, I also look for someone during the interview who is personable and, you know, able to have, you know, decent communication because, again, you know, it's it's a small chambers. It's just five of us. And I want them to be able to um, communicate well with their law clerks and also communicate well with me. As I mentioned earlier, a big part of the work that my law clerks um, perform involves being very vocal about what their um, opinion and their analysis is on pretty much every single case that comes before the court. So I want to see somebody who um, is willing and able to express themselves and not afraid to speak their mind because that's a big part of what um, we're looking for. I want to hear their opinion and, and their analysis of all the cases. Um, um, I do something similar with my, my interviews. Um, certainly they meet, when they come in, they meet with my secretary. And then um, depending on who's in, particularly this year, since all of the law clerks haven't been in um, every single day, but during the time that I was interviewing, um, at least one law clerk was here. So I would have the, um, uh, the candidate meet with my law clerks so that they could chat them up and see if it's somebody who um, is, is able to communicate well and, and, and have a conversation. And so, um, so that's really important. Um, as far as what I'm looking for in, um, you know, their resumes and their applications, I'm certainly looking for somebody with strong writing skills. Um, law review is not a threshold requirement for me. I didn't do law review. So I think, so I don't, you know, that's not, you know, an absolute requirement, but I am looking for somebody who has strong writing skills, um, no typos. <laughs> I'm pretty <laughs> serious when it comes to typos, you know, particularly when applying for a position. Um, if you're submitting one letter and one writing sample for a chance at a phenomenal opportunity to clerk, even if you have to read and reread that two dozen times, do it <laughs> because there really shouldn't be any typos. And for me, that's concerning because as a law clerk here at this court, they will be doing a lot of writing. There's a lot of paper that comes through these chambers. So, you know, as I've mentioned, my clerks will uh, draft extensive bench memos, memos for petitions for certifications. They assist me with opinions. So if I'm getting 15 pages from a candidate and there's typos in it, that's concerning when I know that my clerks are going to be generating hundreds and hundreds of pages of work product throughout the year that's going to be coming to me and going out to the other members of the court. So I really want to see um, in your submission, in your application, an attention to detail and making sure that um, your application is, you know, is as perfect as, as can be. And, you know, I would tell um, law students, don't afraid to ask for help. Um, when I was a law student, I went to career services and made sure they helped me with my resume, made sure they checked my um, writing sample, um, made sure they checked my cover letter and gave me tips on how to improve it. I know times change with what's allowed in resumes. I don't remember I don't remember putting interest into my resume when I was in law school, but I am starting to see more resumes come through with the interests um, that Judge Tarantino mentioned. You know, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence on that, but, um, but yeah, you know, take your, take your materials to career services, get their insight and expertise so that you have the best application possible. Have a friend read your cover letter just again to make sure it reads well and it looked because that's the, you know, and it looks good because that's the first, you know, impression that we get here in chambers. And, um, you know, my secretary, she goes through those applications before I do. And she flags ones that... <laughs> have my name spelled wrong or, you know, the name of the court incorrect, but these are, you know, these are the things that happens. And, and I know applying for clerkships can be a pretty stressful um, time frame because it's often the case that you're applying to a lot of different courts, but you still have to have that attention to detail and make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. So those are some of the things that I would say. Um, um, but yeah, 
certainly for interview, make sure you're professional, make sure you're on time, um, make sure you, you know, come with extra copies of your resume and writing sample. Um, it's always interesting when somebody walks in and has nothing in their hands. I don't, I, you know, I always think you should have something. <laughs> You should have extra copies if I need it, um, or or if you know if you hadn't submitted a, a writing sample originally. I always appreciate that. So, um, so those are those are some of some of my 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 tips. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, any judges? Uh, any other thoughts? Any additional thoughts on that question? I just have to echo what Justice Pierre Louis just said. Uh, the typos really um, are a problematic. Um, and, and I understand it because I will write an opinion and I will read it 17 times before and I'll think it's fine. And then I always give it to my secretary to read the last version and she'll find a typo. You don't see it because you've been writing it for so long. So give it to someone else. But it really does reflect poorly. I, I have to say, I don't know if every state does this, but I know New Jersey has the equivalent of the common app for colleges. Um, in the resume system, you file it once and then you pick the judges that you want to, to, is that correct? There's just one resume that gets put into the portal. Yes. And then, and then you put, so you don't have to, in the old days, when I, <laughs> when I would have been clerking, I would have had to write a letter to each judge and send a resume to each judge. You just have to get it right once and then click the judges that you want. Um, to consider it. So I think that we make it easier for applicants, uh, but certainly that is uh, critical to put your best foot forward. If I could add, um, you know, in the, in the interview, it's okay to be nervous. It's okay, everybody, you should be a little nervous because otherwise you don't care, but be a little nervous, that's fine. And just be yourself because that's who you're gonna be during the year. You know, if you're pretentious or you're pretending to be somebody else that will, um, that will show very obviously through. Um, just be yourself. And, um, you know, if the judge likes you because you are who you are, then that'll be a good fit with that judge. Good, good. And um, I did I did make a mistake. You can, as an applicant, tailor your resume and or cover letter to a specific judge. So you can upload different documents in the portal in your account and then apply to each judge with different documents can do that but you can use one to but you can use one if you want to <laughs> right. oh, like the common to. app in, in college which is also you're gonna make changes make right. sure you <laughs> yes yes right. exactly you're gonna make changes exactly. make sure you don't spell something yes. wrong it's right because you don't want you don't want to get knocked out just because right. of that and right. I, I i will tell you you know i i was nominated in june of last year i was still at my firm and i was getting tons of applications. And when I started applying, you know, one of the ways to, you know, <laughs> focus that list was, well, which ones aren't, you know, which ones have the typos? And there was a pile that had typos that had my name spelled incorrectly that just, you know, got, were knocked out, you know, from the first instance. So. I, I want to also echo that uh, we don't, some, some judges, because of the specific work that they do, do have certain cutoffs for, for um, you have to have a done law review or not, but the vast majority of us, I think, will look at the person holistically. And it's much more important that they fit with chambers staff because we do work under very close quarters when we are in chambers uh, than anything else. So I don't have a cutoff for law review. I don't have a cutoff for grades. I do look at classes where writing was required and I do want to see decent grades in those classes, but you shouldn't feel as if you cannot apply for a clerkship because of a certain grade. Um, I don't expect you to have an A in uh, tax, no offense, Mr. Chen, but you know that's a tough class and that shouldn't preclude you from a clerkship. Um, but I do want to see better grades in the writing courses. Okay. And, and, and Jialing, um, you know, as someone who has recently gone through the application process utilizing our portal, um, any advice to the law students uh, uh, about applying in the overall interview process? Um, I would say do research on a judge. Um, 
uh, if you go to Lexus, you could type in the name of the judge and it'll give you all the opinions that the judge issues. So you could read some of them and get an idea of what the judges do. Um, and you could put some of the, um, the opinions in your cover letter or, um, or um, at least get an idea of what um, the judge is working on. And also be prepared to talk about the classes that you took or the experiences that are listed on a resume. Um, when I went to interview, uh, my judge asked me a very technical question about partnership tax because she saw that I took that class. So prepare to talk about classes, prepare to talk about your experiences. So. Gotcha, gotcha. Good, good. And overall, I gotta say, you know, when you are interviewing, just make sure you do show a level of confidence uh, in yourself. Uh, you know who you are. Uh, as a recruiter, I can speak on this and probably the only part of this I can speak on. <laughs> but be yourself when you interview and let that shine through. Um, uh, another question for all the panelists, and I'll start off with Judge Tarantino. Um, what are uh, potential career paths at the judiciary uh, after completing a, a, a clerkship? Career for continuing to work in the judiciary? Yeah. Well, um, there are attorneys who are needed in the various divisions to help run the divisions. Um, and you're not going to become a division manager right away. But we have uh, attorneys who work in the family division. Uh, they're hearing officers for domestic violence cases. And um, we have other people who uh, work within the state. They're hearing officers for child support cases. Um, uh, with also within the judiciary, we have, we have some people who are in the civil division who have uh, assisted the division manager with uh, resolving cases through mediation. Um, and so the people who are attorneys have tended to um, uh, advance quit more quickly in their, in their careers in, in the judiciary. And, and don't forget, there's also opportunities to work for um, state agencies, public defenders, prosecutors, attorney generals. Um, uh, so, there's, there's lots of opportunities to get jobs that are not in the private sector. Gotcha. Okay, good, good. Uh, Judge, Judge Bernardi Burns, have, have you, um, do you have any, uh, any thoughts on that as well? Um, I do find that a lot of uh, my clerks have gravitated towards public sector work where they weren't really sure what they wanted to do before. I also did a children in court docket when I sat in family and a lot of my clerks really um, love that work. And I have one that ended up being a deputy attorney general doing that work and one uh, a, a, a law guardian doing that work. I have another clerk that is in the prosecutor's office in Middlesex. These were people who really didn't know what they wanted to do when they came into the clerkship, but have been very successful in the public sector. I wanted to add because I know that uh, we, we are heavy for Rutgers here. Most of my clerks were not, did not go to state schools. Um, most, most of my clerks, and it just happened that way. I'm not looking specifically for Rutgers or specifically for Seton Hall or specifically for any school. I'm looking for a good fit. And um, if you did not go to a state school, you are likely not familiar with the New Jersey rules of court, which is what, where everything starts in New Jersey. The rules of court are you know, the, the, the bedrock for any law in New Jersey. So clerking, if you want to work in New Jersey in your career, clerking will give you the advantage that you will have a year to learn the New Jersey rules of court, which if you did not attend a New Jersey law school, you probably haven't been exposed to. So I think that's another advantage for those uh, law students on this uh, uh, call today uh, who may be interested in working in New Jersey, but have not gone to school in New Jersey. And that will not preclude you from a clerkship. There's no advantage to having gone to a New Jersey school. Um, in obtaining a New Jersey clerkship. It's just, it just so happens that we all went to Rutgers on, on this particular panel. Gotcha. 
Um, a question for all, all panelists again. Are you looking for any type of past internship experiences uh, from applicants? Um, I don't, you know, I, I, I think it's, I, I'd like to see that, you know, um, law students have um, interned or externed for a judge because I know that they've had some experience being in a courtroom, um, being in a courtroom and being in chambers and understanding the, the flow of work. I mean, even though it might not necessarily be the same work that they're doing um, um, here at the Supreme Court. But, you know, I think that's something that's that's a plus um, if they've had an opportunity um, to intern um, during law school. And I think it shows that they're you know taking initiative to really, um, you know, invest their time in their future and in their careers if they, you know, have the opportunity um, during law school to, to work with a judge. So, you know, I, I see that as a plus, but, you know, again, as has already been mentioned, I look at the, you know, look at the entire resume, look at the entire person to, to, to get a sense of their experience and background. And just to piggyback on that, I, I, I'm not so concerned with internship experience, but what the basic experience is. For example, um, someone applied, and I'm in criminal division now, they had all of these prior um, activities in really more family division type experiences. My law clerk who's coming in this August, she interned in the public defender's office. She was in the uh, prosecutor's office. And then she also interned for a um, very prominent criminal defense attorney I thought she was a blue chip uh, pick. I was amazed that on Wednesday, following the Monday portal being open, that she was still available. And we, you know, and, and she did great on the interview. You know, we offered her the job right on the spot. And um, I'm very, very happy to get her. I mean, that, I feel like, you know, like the NFL draft, that she was like the number one pick for a criminal division. But the point is, she, it's more important to have the experience that's more in line with what we're doing, in, in my opinion, than other things. Yeah, I, I do cool. want to dispel the notion that judges pick clerks from their interns. Um, that's, that's not true. We look at all of the resumes that are submitted. I know that there is this, um, this notion that if you, if you intern for a particular judge, uh, you're more likely to get a clerkship. And that certainly hasn't been the case for me. And I, I don't know anyone for whom that is the case. Okay. All right. So we're, we're getting a lot of good questions from the audience. And if you do have some, some questions, uh, we're coming up towards the end, but uh, send them in. Uh, we'll try to ask the panelists, but uh, this is a good one. The, the pandemic has affected 2L uh, summer hiring over the past year. How are judges taking that into consideration during uh, clerkship applications this year? Well, it, it's giving us a broader pool to pick from. Uh, when, the, when the economy's humming, uh, we have a smaller pool of applicants. So I, I am, uh, um, although I feel for the two L's, I do, it's a difficult market out there. Uh, it does give us uh, a, a better pool, or I shouldn't say a better pool, a larger pool to pick from than we normally see. Gotcha. And yeah, and I think there's an understanding that whatever work was done this past summer is not going to traditionally be the work that was, you know, that that was performed in previous years. It's not, you know, seven or eight week long uh, law firm um, uh, summer associate positions because a lot of law firms cut those and, you know, so things just changed um, dramatically, of course, with the pandemic. So, I, so there's certainly an understanding that, you know, that time frame isn't going to look exactly like it has in the past few years. Good, good. Um, let me see another question from the audience. Um, Judge Tarantino, uh, can you explain how uh, your former law clerks have been able to utilize you as a resource once they, you know, start their legal career? Oh, yes. This, it's very important to me to continue to have a professional relationship with my law clerks. I, I don't need any more children. I have two grown children and a, a grandchild on the way. So I have enough family. But um, I want to, uh, I'm interested in their professional development and achievement. Um, like Judge Bradley Byrne, we, we uh, meet every, um, every uh, end of October for my birthday dinner. <laughs> it used to be lunch, now it's dinner. And, um, but we stay in touch. 
I, I encourage them to help each other. Two of my law clerks actually work in the same office. Uh, number two and number five work in the same law guardian office. And it's always, it always really uh, is very encouraging to me that they, they rely on each other. But I also check in with them to see how they're doing, uh, to see if they're happy, if they're learning. And um, uh, I, do, I am genuinely interested in, in their professional development and, and their, their careers. Um, also, you know, we, we get a little personal too. We just had um, what I call the baby party. Two of, two of them had, uh, child, had babies a, a year ago and to celebrate their one-year-old birthday, we had like a, a Zoom session for an hour and they were showing the babies and we're all talking and laughing. Um, it was a lot of fun, but I think that fostered uh, unity and camaraderie, um, uh, which will only help in the future. Good. Our law clerks are a great source of pride for us. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we like to brag about them like, like we brag about our children. We like to know that they're doing well. We like to know that they're happy. We, we like them to reach out to us and ask us for advice or, or recommendations or whatnot. So, yeah, when, yeah. when a couple of times, I'm sorry, when a couple of times when I've gotten calls from law clerk, former law clerks, judge, what should I do? That is number one priority. I, I will drop everything because that is so important to, to know that they're, I'm gratified to know that they're reaching out to me and I want to help them as, as much as I can. I'm sorry. Oh um, yeah, no, that's fine. That's exactly what I was going to say. I was going to say, you know, the, the bond that you, um, that that's created between the judge and the law clerk is, is lifelong. And, you know, for me personally, after my clerkship with Justice Wallace, I stayed in very close contact with him and called him very often <laughs> uh, for advice and, and, and his perspective when I was making different um, decisions um, in my career. And, and I've also bonded with his other law clerks, um, with, within the Justice Wallace law clerk family, as we, we call ourselves, we see each other, you know, in normal years, at least twice a year at an annual clerkship dinner in Gloucester County. And then again, Labor Day weekend, when Justice Wallace opens his house up to us and all of our children <laughs> for, for a barbecue. And we've gotten to know each other really well. So I've had an opportunity to um, create a bond with all of his law clerks. And that's his law clerks spanning over 25 years from trial court appellate level to the Supreme Court. We've all had a chance to know each other and some of us know each other as well as if we clerk together. So, um, so it's really a, 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 a great, one of the greatest benefit, biggest benefits of clerking the bond that you're able to create with, with your judge. And as a judge, I am sure it was a full circle moment for Justice Wallace <laughs> to have you ascend <laughs> to the Supreme Court because that's, uh, 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 an immense source of pride for us. It is like seeing our children succeed. Absolutely. He was very, very happy and continues to be. <laughs> um, so another question from the audience uh, and this, you know, we, we may uh, brag uh, on New Jersey a little bit for, with this one, but how does clerking with New Jersey courts differ from a clerkship in other states, like especially the tri-state area? And what are like the, 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 I guess, the main benefits of clerkships in New Jersey? Hmm. Well, <laughs> if anyone knows, <laughs> I will brag. Uh, we're progressive. We're always at the forefront uh, in legal issues. Our uh, criminal justice reform is renowned throughout the country. Um, we are one of the few states that did away with bail. Um, a couple of years ago, and it's had an a, amazing success. We are one of the few states that actually has a chancery, a chancellor uh, division. Um, so we are, we are at the forefront of almost every legal issue in the country. And we did not take a day off during the pandemic. We closed March 15th and on March 18th, we all had hearings and we had them virtually. And we have had, I forget what the number is, uh, Chief Justice Rabner just sent it out yesterday, but I know in Morris Sussex County, we've had over 150,000 hearings since the pandemic began all virtually. So we never took a day off. Um, and I think that um, particularly for this class of law clerks, one of the skills that these law clerks will have is their, um, their uh, understanding of technology and remote technology. They've learned all this and it has made them that much more marketable in uh, a global environment. Right. Um, 
Let me see. Now, you know, with 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 COVID happening and everything, and you know, assuming with vaccinations that we get close to, I guess, something of a new normal, quote unquote. Um, how do you think the courts will take what we've learned over the past year? And, you know, once things open up, uh, potentially, uh, what do you think is, is going to happen then? Um, what are we going to take from now and incorporate into, say, next year when everything seems to be open? Hopefully open. Yeah, I think I think that remains to to be seen. But you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some things stay and some things you know go back to to normal. But um, cer certainly something that the judiciary will be taking a look at. Um, if you know things work well in a certain format, then maybe that can continue. But you know, I, I think that's something that the judiciary will have to to take a look at. And, and we've been looking at what works better in a, in a virtual format. I, I know that some litigants would prefer not to take the entire day off, for example, for a child support hearing and have uh, given us feedback. I know Ju Judge Grant, the um, acting um, a, a judge of the courts, has, has asked for feedback from the Bar Association, from litigants, from judges. I, I do believe that we will be back, that law clerks and judges will be back in the courtroom. But I think that some things will be handled virtually on a going forward basis, depending on um, whether they are uh, more accessible to the public. I'll give you an example. I do adult guardianships and those, the, the, the subject is usually severely disabled and it's hard for them and their caregivers to get into court and take the day to come into court to, to, um, to testify. And I have been able to do those virtually and the families, the guardians have been very appreciative of that. So I think that those, there are areas and if you know Judge Grant, he's studying those areas um, carefully to determine what works better and what's more efficient. So I do think that we're going to see some hybrid proceedings going forward but what those will be we don't know yeah. you know juries will come back at some point we need juries to come back right right all right so i have i have one final question uh, i'm going to ask um before we get to some next steps and some um uh, and some questions in regards to our portal uh but for justice pierre lewis uh how, how would a clerkship at the new jersey supreme court compare to a uh, say federal district clerkship based on what you witnessed from your time at AUSA also? Uh, so, so I think it's, so I think uh, the differences would be um, uh, it's more so an appellate uh, le being at the appellate level versus being at the district court. So, um, you know, the work as a clerk at the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals might be more similar to the work of a law clerk at a state Supreme Court because you are here, it is an appellate court and you're doing a lot of researching and a lot of writing. A federal district court clerkship is a trial level court. So, you know, as a law clerk in um, the district court, the law clerks uh, work on a lot of the matters that are coming before the court work on cases that are going to trial, whether criminal or civil, work on, you know, assisting the judge with um, sentencings or plea hearings and um, other matters that come before the court. So it's, you know, so it's a trial level court. So certainly um, that's a big difference than a court that's hearing only um, appellate matters. Um, but, um, but, you know, certainly a significant amount of all the benefits that we've talked about of clerking certainly would apply, um, to those, to those clerkship as, clerkships as well. Um, I, I externed for Judge Irenas in Camden when I was at, um, when I was at Rutgers in law school. And that was, a, that was a great experience. I had the opportunity to sit in, um, and watch jury selection, um, in a couple of crim in a couple of criminal trials, um, watch the trials. Um, I had an opportunity to watch civil trials um, proceed and, you know, get some familiarity with uh, a, a, the inner workings and the behind the scenes of the federal court, which is exactly what um, uh, law clerks would um, get, the experience they would get in the, the state court system. So, so hopefully that answers that question. But, you know, um, it's more a matter of uh, whether it's an appellate court or, or a trial level court. 
Okay, thank you so much for that perspective. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. All right. So um, let's see uh, what what I'd like to I'd like to thank you know our panel uh, and everyone in the audience for participating today. Uh, we will be sending up a, a follow up uh, email to today's participants or your law school for distribution um, to today's participants with uh, additional information and responses to any remaining questions. Uh, some next steps for any three L students out there still looking for judicial clerkships. There are a limited uh, number of vacancies available for the 21-22 court term. That starts in August 21. Uh, to apply, please vi visit our website. Uh, some additional key dates that you should be made aware of. Um, the recruitment cycle for the 2022-23 uh, clerkship term officially starts June 1st uh, uh, this year when our, our notice of vacancy is posted, which is posted more than a year in advance. Um, ac applications or applicants will be able to start applying to these positions on June 21st. Justices and judges uh, may begin scheduling interviews and making offers of employment on June 28th to apply to a judicial clerkship position. Uh, please visit our website um, at www.ijcourts.gov and go to the law clerk recruitment page. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free uh, to send them to lawclerkfaq at njcourts.gov. You may get me uh, when you get an answer. Um, but again, thank you to our panel, uh, Judge Bergodi Burns, J Judge Tarantino, uh, Justice Pierre Louis, um, and our law clerk, uh, Jeling Chen, um, and, the, and the audience for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we hope you consider a judicial clerkship with New Jersey courts. Uh, please join us for our second scheduled webinar session, uh, which is next week on the 24th, uh, where we're going to be featuring judges representing our civil, family, and appellate divisions. And, and we have a third session on the 31st uh, featuring judges from the tax uh, uh, court, which will be Judge Malasandar, and our civil and family divisions as well. I uh, hope to see everybody there. Uh, be safe uh, and have a great day. Um, the, the work of the courts continues. Have a good one.